So there is one more calibration parameter here. This is the grouping calibration parameter for light frames. Just like we saw for the dark frames, we can group light frames together for calibration purposes. So if we need to match, again, some dark frame uh, to match with this light frame data, we might group by a particular um, exposure time, a difference in exposure time. So the two seconds is fine if you have very small variations between light frame exposure from frame to frame. If we really wanted to group for some reason at a larger value than that, which is um, not typical, that would be an, uh, an, an uncommon thing to do. But if you did need to, you would just raise this number up. What is more common, and I'm gonna skip ahead and just show it to you now, is the last of these grouping ones for exposure tolerance over here. This is where you want to group the exposure times of already calibrated light frames. So this is the one where if I have different exposure times, say I have 600 second exposures here and 480 second exposures here, and at the end of the post-processing that WBPP is going to do, I want it to give me a single integrated image weighting the 480 second exposures and the 600 second exposures accordingly, then what I do is this is where I would increase the exposure time. Now watch what happens here. I have two reds, two greens, two blues, because I have two different exposure times, right? But if I make this a difference of again 200 seconds, now I will end up with a single red, green, and blue with the, um, the light frames being combined through image integration all together but they will also be weighted. Keep in mind, if we, when we have the subframe weighting in play, they will be weighted properly so that the, the averaging, the combining of that data will be proper. You will actually add in the shorter exposures for what they are truly worth. So that's where that is. Now, this is not a calibration thing. This is instead a uh, post-processing thing. So back to calibration here. Let's look now within the, you know, the calibration uh, panel. And it's here that we get to see some of the options for each of the groups that we're operating on, as well as the fact uh, that, uh, you know, flat fields, for example, they need to be calibrated themselves. So we got to be sure that there is a matching that occurs between the flats and their calibration data, as well as the lights and their calibration data. So I'm going to actually start with flat fields. So to see what's going on with a flat, I have a red exposure here. This is indicating the red group, and there are a bunch of them, 22 frames. Um, and it says it's going to use a bias frame to calibrate them. And that is actually correct, because I've given it a bias frame. So I'm signifying, I'm signaling here that that's what it should use. Now, why does it come to that conclusion? It comes to that conclusion because, let me click here, here are the options for this group and this group and this group. The options are going to be the same. Um, the option is here to match a dark frame with this exposure. So this exposure apparently was very long, 49 seconds, but I don't have a 49 second long. Now that's, that's very long, by the way. I, I don't know what was going on here in this data, but um, I don't have a matching 49 second dark frame. The dark current in 49 seconds is still pretty small so that I can use, because I have a well-behaved camera, I can just use a bias frame to, to calibrate this flat field image and it's going to work out just fine. So the logic in WPPP is that if it cannot match an exact match with a dark frame in this list and there is a bias frame available, it will use it. That's the logic behind WBPP at the moment. It used to be that WBPP would actually give you a warning. And the warning is fair just because we're not actually matching a dark like we're asking it to do. But nowadays, it's kind of just understood, it's tacitly understood, that if we don't give it a matching dark and we have a bias frame, we're going to use the bias frame because that's really what it's for. Um, but it is you, it's, this, is, this is the you thing. You have to look at the screen here and just understand that's what's being used. If you don't mean for that to be used in that way, then of course you can change the configuration. 
So another way to verify that this is, you know, you can see the check mark there and you can see that this is now green, which is indicating that this group will be calibrated by this group once it creates a master. You can also show the diagram here and that explicitly says that a flat field from this group will be calibrated by the master bias that's created by this group and then I'll end up with a calibrated flat. So that is exactly what's going on here and everything is being um, you know, ultimately spelled out. So that's what's happening with, for flats here and I'm just going to say another statement here. I would highly recommend that you do not do the following and I express this um, very strongly in my section on dark frame scaling. Do not use any of these darks to calibrate these short exposure flats. It's just not very good practice. You will not generally end up with very good results or the best results. So either create a dark frame of the same exposure time that would be called a, a flat dark or you would, you would um, uh, use a bias frame to calibrate it. Now in a subsequent video I'll explain of course that flat fields need to be of the correct type if we have a color filter array. This is monochrome data so I don't need to check this but if this was a color image then the CFA images we would need to say yes and so we can check the box here that says yes and then we can also check the box that will separate the uh, the color filter array flat field uh, flat scaling factors that's going to uh, be on a per channel basis that's also in general a nice thing to do okay the light frames they have more options for the light frames here for the light frames we have a similar kind of matching logic where now we're going to be matching not only uh, a dark frame which could also be a bias if they're very short um, but also a flat field image as well so whenever we click on something and this time i'll click on a blue we can see that uh, we have checked here is a dark frame will be used to calibrate and a flat field image and which one well it's this flat field and that's blue and that's blue so that matches and it's this dark frame 600 seconds because this is indeed a 600 second exposure so that matches so it's communicating here what we have asked it to do here and everything is working out if I didn't have an exposure here I would have an X it, it would not a match with a dark frame and then that would be something of an error because we're asking it to find one and one does not exist. So that's part of it. The other things that we can do, um, very typical things to do, is to have a cosmetic correction template already set up. You'll notice that I actually have it on the desktop here and this is standard kind of procedure for a PixInsight, for a PixInsight workflow is that you're going to employ cosmetic correction as part of the calibration process. After the data is calibrated, uh, try to minimize the hot pixels in the data. So you can, once you have created this template, you can uh, point at it here. It's on the desktop. And if you have more than one, of course, you can select from them. The cool thing about cosmetic correction right now is that if you did have more than one, because you can have different versions of cosmetic correction in different uh, there's different ways of doing it, then you can associate them with each group. So you'll notice here that when I go to a different group, this gets reset to none because it's only being applied to this particular group right here. Now, of course, in this particular case, and I would say in most cases, unless you become a little bit more advanced, you're going to be applying the same cosmetic correction across all of the groups. So if I press this button to apply to all light frames, you'll see that I don't need to go and individually click on the template here. It'll just apply now cosmetic correction across all of the group, all of the light frame groups here. Just very quickly, if we show the calibration diagram, you can see exactly what again is going to happen. It's what I described where we have the blue image uh, being calibrated by a master dark from this group here and this master flat is coming from this group here so that we end up with a calibrated light frame which is exactly what we want to have happen. If this were again color information uh, with a, a one-shot color camera sensor then we would need to turn this on and convert these things to color. I'm not going to do that but that's what you would do. You can see it made a little color icon here and then you would have to specify the method um, that is the pattern that it's going to um, colorize, debayer the image as. 
um, if it's already written in the file header, the auto is going to use that information. If that information does not exist, then you need to specify which one of the patterns of your one-shot color camera um, uses. And most of the time, it's the first one on the list. It's RGGB. But this is something else that I point out in fast track training. You know, you should discover what that is for your sensor. You just need to do it once, and then the pattern doesn't change. You'll always know what it is. There's one last section here, and this is really more for people that are doing the narrow band imaging, where a pedestal may be required in order to prevent a certain kind of over subtraction that that occurs because the the sky is so dark um, and just due to noise levels you can get a kind of over subtraction when you uh, calibrate the image that you want to avoid so you can create a, a pedestal value that's going to raise those values up and determining what that level is there's actually an automatic way of doing it where PixInsight will look at the data as it subtracts your dark and it'll figure out what pedestal value is necessary but uh, the literal value is once you've determined for your sensor typically what the problem or what the the pedestal should be you can just put in that value every time I have a video in this series which explains what it looks like to see that over subtraction how do you know and then how to figure out what value you should put in here if you don't use the automatic method so this is explained subsequently but that's where the um, the adjustment is for that particular setting. One final thing I want to note about this panel is that in general the whole idea behind the automation is that we're relying on information that is in the FITS header to match light data or flat field information with their corresponding calibration data whether it be darks or biases and so on. Um, but we don't have to match if there's some reason that there is some, you know, if there's some file that we need to do the matching ourselves with because it doesn't have the right information, or be ha perhaps there is just something else we need to do that does not work with the matching logic, then you can actually specify a particular file here by not using auto. Uh, so you can specify a group. Um, so this group would be calibrated with some other dark or some other flat just by utilizing these pull-down menus here. So what I've described so far is all about just the calibration only. Uh, the future sections here, the subsequent sections of this WBPP series will talk about the post-calibration processing which includes these items here. So I'll be getting, and we need to look at them in turn, so I'll get to those in just a moment. But as far as calibration is concerned, you know, if I just wanted to output this data now, just the calibrated version of this data, then I can specify an output directory and then I can uncheck all of the things here. And it, all it will do is calibration. It won't go any further than that. And, and I've argued that this is an important way to approach using WBPP, especially for those that are just beginning. Let me show you first what the output looks like and then I'll make uh, an argument that it's a good thing to do initially before using the pipeline fully to use its full uh, implementation of everything, its full um, set of uh, uh, powers, if you will. I'm going to exit out of here and just show you the directories that you get when you output information from WBPP. Initially, as you know, you're going to get calibrated data. So you're going to get a folder that has just calibrated information. Now, Flat field images are calibrated just like light frames, right? So we'll have folders in here for calibrated flat fields as well as calibrated light frames. Now I have different exp I have different folders here because I have different groups because I have the different exposure times at the moment. But um, if we look at any file in particular, what you'll see is there's an underscore C. That C stands for calibrated. So you need to understand these are the folders that we're going to see. And then the next folder we should see created are the cosmetized. These are the ones that have cosmetic correction applied. So if we look at one of the files here, we'll find that there is now a C followed by an underscore CC for a cosmetic correction. Now that's the convention that WBPP uses. C and then an underscore CC. And then if we were to continue, this would be the last step. If I had a color sensor, 
then it would also proceed to output a debayered image, and then that would be it as far as a calibrate only is kind of concerned. Um, so you would have an underscore D for debayered. But as far as post-processing is concerned, if you did continue, you can see here that I have a registered folder. So these are going to have now yet another suffix added to the file name. You can see it says C underscore CC. If I had a color image, it would be underscore D and then underscore R. So this really does give you all of the steps that have been employed with that particular file um, as it has run through the pipeline of WBPP. Now the argument for just starting with the, the, uh, the calibration only kind of output is that the post-processing steps of registration, of image integration, and some other things like uh, the normalization stuff, rejection stuff, all of those settings, I think it's best to approach them um, in a manual sense at least once or twice so that you can see how those processes are set up. And then you'll understand the setup of them here because the same, uh, the same parameters are echoed in WBPP as far as the post-processing is concerned. So if we did look at post-calibration, I'm calling it post-processing, post-calibration, um, if you looked at one of these areas here, let's say we look at image uh, registration, you can see that there are parameters here. And whether or not you adjust those parameters is a discussion to be had, but that discussion is much easier if you've used the star alignment process. This is the process that's used um, before. So uh, that's what I do in fast track training. I show people calibration only and then step through the post calibration stuff. But of course, ultimately you want to just have WBPP do it all for you. And once you understand how those processes work, uh, that's a, then the power is all within your hands and everything should work out very, very well.